It transpired that his hostile neighbor from then onwards gave him no peace. He renewed his raids and attacks, and Dasa was forced to resort to defense measures and raids of reprisal. If the enemy slipped through his hands, he had perforce to allow his soldiers and huntsmen to inflict new damage upon his neighbors. In the city, more and more armed men and horsemen were to be seen, and in many of the frontier villages, soldiers were now stationed permanently on guard. War councils and preparations for new forays made the days restless. Dasa could not see the use of this guerrilla warfare and grieved for the sufferings of the victims, for the lives of the killed, pined for his garden and his books, which he was forced more and more to forego, and for the peace of his days and heart. He spoke frequently with Gopala, the Brahmin, and sometimes even with his wife, Parvati. He insisted that they should summon one of the respected neighboring princes to act as an arbitrator and to strive for to make peace terms. For his part, would willingly relinquish a few meadows and villages in order to reach a peaceful settlement. When he saw that neither the Brahmins nor Parvati would hear of such a thing, he was disappointed and also somewhat indignant. The difference of opinion with Parvati led to a serious dispute, even to a rift. He presented his reasons and thoughts lucidly and imploringly, but she received each word as, the, as though it had been directed not against war and useless slaughter, but against herself personally. It was, she informed him in an impassioned speech, exactly the enemy's object to exploit Dasa's tolerance of love and peace, not to mention his fear of war to his advantage. He would bring him to sign peace treaties one after another and to pay each time with greater sacrifice of territory and lives. And in the end, far from being satisfied and as soon as he considered Dasa to be weak enough, he would declare open war on him and rob him of everything. It was a question not of herds and villages, of profits and losses, but of the whole. It was a question of survival or of destruction. And if Dasa did not know wherein lay his duty and his honor, which he owed to his wife and child, then she must teach him. Her eyes flamed and her voice quivered, and although he had not seen her so beautiful and passionate for a long time, he experienced only a profound sense of grief. In the meantime, the frontier incidents and breaches of peace continued, and only the rainy season put an end to them. In Dasa's court, there were now two parties. The one, the peaceful party, was very small, for apart from Dasa himself, only a few of the older Brahmins and scholarly men who were almost completely preoccupied with their meditations belonged to it. The war party, however, Pravati's and Gopala's party, had the majority of the priests and officers on its side. They eagerly gave orders to arm and knew that their hostile neighbor was doing the same. The boy, Ravana, was taught the use of the bow by the chief's huntsman, and his mother often took him with her to review the troops. Dasa frequently thought of his sojourn in the forest when, as a wretched fugitive, he had rested a while, and of the white-haired sage who lived in meditation. Time and again his thoughts turned to this old man, and he felt a longing to seek him out, to see him once more, and to ask his counsel. He did not know whether the yogi was still alive, but even if he were and condescended to give him his advice, he wondered whether everything would not take its natural course and whether nothing at all would come of it. Contemplation and wisdom were good and noble things, it seemed, but they were things apart and applied only to the fringes of life. Whoever swam in life's stream and struggled with the waves, where deeds and sufferings had nothing to do with wisdom, had to surrender himself to his destiny which had to be suffered and accomplished. Nor did the gods live in eternal peace and wisdom. They, too, were familiar with danger and fear, struggle and slaughter, as he knew from many stories. So, 
Dasa surrendered. No longer quarreled with Pravati and wrote to all the reviews. He distinctly saw the approach of war felt in his disturbingly nightly dreams and as his figure grew more haggard and his face grew darker, saw the happiness and pleasure of his life fading and growing pale. There remained only his love for the boy, which increased with sorrow, increased with the arming and exercising of the troops, and became the one burning scarlet blossom in his garden. He was amazed to find how much emptiness and lack of joy one can bear, how injured one can become to care and aversion, and how, in a heart which was now apparently devoid of passion, such timorous and anxious love could bloom into something burning and imperious. Even though his life were perhaps meaningless, it was nevertheless not without a core and a nucleus, for it turned about the love for his son. On account of him, he would rise betimes from his couch and pass his days in preoccupations and energies whose goal was war and which were repulsive to him. On account of him, he would listen patiently to the counsels of the leader and only oppose the resolutions of the majority when they were too hasty and threatened to plunge them all into some uncalculated adventure. Just as his joy of life, his garden and his books gradually became estranged and of no solace to him, he also found that she, who for so many years had been the happiness and pleasure of his life, was becoming more and more inconstant. It had started with politics, and on the day when Pravati had made that passionate speech, in which, with undignified scorn, she had treated his horror of transgression and love of peace as cowardice. When she had spoken with burning cheeks and fiery words about princely honor, heroism, and insults received, he had been struck and had felt, with a sudden sense of giddiness, how far apart his wife and he had grown. Since then, the rift between them had widened and grown even wider, each day without either of them lifting a finger to repair it. Furthermore, it was Dasa who had decided to pursue his course, and it became more and more an example of the rift of all rifts, of the world abyss between man and woman, between yea and nay, between soul and body. When he looked back, he thought he could see it all quite clearly. How once Pravati, with her magical beauty, had trifled with him and inflamed his feelings until he had cut loose from his comrades and friends, the herdsmen, and from the life which had hitherto been so peaceful. How, on her account, he had gone to live in service among strangers, had become a son-in-law in a house of worthless people who had exploited his love for Pravati in order that he might work for them. Then Nala had appeared on the scene, and his misfortunes had begun. Nala, the rich, dazzling Raja, had seduced his wife, had seduced the poor girl, so unused to luxury, with beautiful clothes and tents, with horses and servants. A conquest which could have cost him very little effort, but could he have seduced her so easily? Had she been inwardly constant and disciplined? No, the Raja had seduced her, or abducted her, and had caused him a hateful pain, such as he had never suffered before. He had taken his revenge, however. He had struck down the thief who had stolen his happiness, and that had been the moment of great triumph. Yet, hardly had he committed this deed than he had been forced to take to flight and live for days, weeks, and months on end in the jungle and the swamps, outlawed and trusting in no man. What had Pravati done during that time? They had never referred to that period. In any case, he reflected. She had not fled to join him, but only when his princely birth had been announced and his people were clamoring for him to mount the throne and occupy the palace had she be come to seek him out. She had simply appeared out of the forest in the neighborhood of the worthy hermit and led him away. He had been decked in fine raiment and had proclaimed Raja and had all the splendor and happiness, but in truth, what had he abandoned at that time for what he had exchanged it? And exchanged it for magnificence and the duties of a prince, duties in which the beginning had not been easy and which had grown more and more onerous. He had exchanged it for repossession of a beautiful wife, for sweet hours of dalliance with her, and then there had been the son. 
His growing love for him and the ever-increasing anxiety for his menaced life and happiness until at last war stood at the gates. This was what Parvati had brought him when she had discovered him in the forest at the spring's edge. What he had abandoned was the peace of the forest and a pious solitude. He had given up the neighborship and, ex and an example of holy yogi, had given up the hope of instruction and perhaps his succession, the deep, radiant, and imperturbable tranquility of the sage and a release from the conflicts and passions of life, seduced by Pravati's beauty, strangled by the woman and tainted with her ambition, he had abandoned the only path along which freedom and peace could be won. This is how his life history appeared to him that day. It was a plausible enough interpretation, and in actual fact it required but few omissions and suppressions for it to appear true. He had, however, omitted to recall, among other things, the fact that he had by no means been the hermit, been the hermit's pupil, and that had intended to leave him again voluntarily. So distorted do things become when they are viewed at some later date. Pravati saw these things quite differently although she devoted far less time to such speculations she thought of nala at all on the contrary if her memory did not deceive her it had been she who had been responsible for dasa's happiness it had been she who raised him to the status of raja again and had presented him with a son only ultimately to find that he was not her equal in greatness and unworthy of her great pride it was clear to her that the impending war could lead to no less than govinda's destruction and to doubling of her own power and possessions instead of being glad of this and instead of being anxious to cooperate Dasa, it seemed to her, strove, on the contrary, in a most unprincely manner against war and conquest and would have preferred to grow old and inactive among his flowers, trees, parrots, and books. Now Vishwamrita, the commander-in-chief of the cavalry, and after herself the most ardent supporter and planner of the coming war and victory, was very different species of man. Every comparison between the two men was obviously to the soldier's advantage.